hey, this week I'm going to be, I'm, I'm continuing on in our War Room uh, series. Uh, this is number six, I believe, in that series. I still have one more message to go, and we've been talking about spiritual warfare. It's important to understand our battle isn't against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of this dark age. And the weapons of our warf- warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. If you are a p- type of person who's doing anything for God, and listen, if you're, if you're a Christian, then you're called to do something for God. You're called to share your, 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 um, the hope of Jesus with, with everybody. That, and if you're one of those key people who's sharing the hope of Jesus with anybody, then you've got a mark on you. You've got a target on you the size of Jesus. <laughs> the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take.
In a welder, it's called slag. It, it, there's inclusions of, you know, hot, you know, um, pockets of air and, and impurities can cause damage to the structural integrity of the metal that you're working with. And so in the Iron Age, they began to work and build these weapons out of this new material, and they searched the world for iron and all the additives. See, steel isn't just iron. There's all kinds of ad- additives, magnesium and, and all kinds of other inclusion that they, they use h- hard substances and, and, and substances, metals that have different strengths and different characteristics to make something very, very hard. And during when the prophet wrote this, actually iron was just becoming a, a major weapon, and they were purifying its process. In the Middle East, and during this time is when they started making katanas, when they started making, you know, the samurai swords. And there's a process, and I want to I show you some of these processes today, but in our lives, we need to be purified. Our metals, there's an old, there's an old saying that says the testing of your metal, M-E-T-T-L-E. You ever heard that? It's testing of your character, testing of your worth. You know, our, the things that we walk through in life test the metal. Metal and metal up into the 1600s were synonymous. They just meant this, the shiny substance that you pulled out of the ground and you worked with. But it also came to mean the metal of our character, the strength of our character, who we actually are. And God has a process, first of all, of purifying us. He uses the trials and the tribulations that we walk through to um, remove the dross. Proverbs 25.4 says this, Remove the dross from the silver, and a silversmith can produce a vessel. And Isaiah 1.25, and keep up with me, because there, there's a whole bunch of scriptures here, Zach. Isaiah 1.25 says, I will turn my hand against you, and I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impurities. How does he do, how does he do this here? Ouch! I mean, I thought God loved me. <laughs> but with the, with, the, with the people, with his own people, sometimes that took the form of, like, I'm turning my hand away from you. I, I, you guys are acting in a way that is unbecoming of somebody who represents my name, and so I'm turning my back on you right now, and I'm going to let the afflictions, the consequences of your actions come upon you. But what was it doing? It was it purifying his people. It was purifying the character of his people. It was purifying them, making them more dependent on you. God, what are you doing here? And as we get into this process of going through troubles and trials and then calling out to him, he begins to reveal things that are going on in our lives that we need to get rid of if we're going to be representatives of his name. Impurities will wreck us. You don't believe me? Go spend all your time forging a weapon and then go to war with it. It's just going to crack, leave you vulnerable. Huh? We need this in our life, people of God, to be purified. The second step, after you've got the the rough material, after you've got the steel, after you've got the metal that you need, the character that you need, that starts to be forged and and molded. Now, some of you have have watched, I I mean, I don't know if if you're a, a YouTube junkie like me, but I like to watch all those DIY things, and I love the Lord of the Rings. Anybody else here? So I've watched a few videos like on how I could make myself sting, right? So they take clay. They take red clay and they get a, like a plastic model of it and they, they take that clay and they'll, they'll make an imprint, right, in the clay and they, they shove that down and they, they build a form around it and, and, and they, they work on one side, they smooth it all out and then they do the same thing for the other side and then they, they take and they melt down this metal, take all the impurities off it and they pour a mold, Right? And out of that mold, you can take off that form and and all the rubble off all the clay, and there will be a rough form of that sword that you wanted. That's called forging something. I I did that in metal shop quite a bit as a kid. I know here in California, all the funding is gone, and so there's no more metal shop. You know, (laughs) boo-hoo. No, actually, we need that. Our kids really could use these kind of, of skills in their life. But I, I, I forged a couple of things, and you do it just like that. You pour this molten metal, and it comes out, and then you've got you've to sand it and get it back into the form. But that's not how the ancients did forgery. That's not how they would make a weapon. Actually, if you just take and pour metal like that, there will be all kinds of impurities in it. That's just like something you get for a, novel, a novelty shop. There's a novelty shop down near Old Town. They've got a bunch of these swords. But if you were to go out and try to fight with that, that thing would just like smash into a billion pieces because they just poured the metal and made it look like something strong. I know in my Christianity, I don't want to just look like something strong. I want to be able to stand the test of time. Their process is they would take little chunks of of iron ore and the steel and the things that they were adding together. Thank you, Daniel. Sitting here 
parched and he always sees it. But they would take these little pieces of metal and they would pump up the furnace. So we've already talked about the furnace. And the furnace would get going and they would take a, a little plate and they'd, they'd st- start stacking all these pieces of metal and they'd, they would take it and shove it into that hot steel, into that hot furnace until it was glowing. And as it was glowing, they would add more onto it. They bring it out, put it on an anvil, and they start hammering it. They start beating it together, hammer welding. That's how they molded or forged steel together until they had enough to make the rough design that they were going to make out of this. It, it's not an easy process. It's a painstaking process. But God's process in our life is the same way. We keep going through like, why am I going through this trial again? I just was in the fire, and now you know, God delivered me, and now I'm in another fire again. And I'm getting hammered on top of it, pounding over and over and over again and back into the oven. And as, as, if you ever go and watch a video on this, you'll see all kinds of slag and everything else falling off of that, that molten steel. But it's a process, the same process that God, he created the blacksmith to, to do this, to fan the flame, to forge a weapon fit for its work. What's, it, what's the work that a sword does? Warfare. Our God uses this process in our life to build us, to make us into something that's usable in his hands. We got to get through, go through the pounding sometimes. Hello. The metal is repeatedly heated until almost molted, bonded together with more until it's present for the final process. God's process of shaping us has always been through hardship. He adds unto our character one piece at a time. I know if he tried to conform you into the image of Christ overnight, you'd probably crumble. Like, I can't do that overnight. I can't become what you want me to be in one set of trials. I would dissolve into a puddle right now. I'm not the same man that I was yesterday, definitely not the same guy I was 30 years ago, but I could, I could write a book on all the hardship that our family has gone through to get me to be even a fraction of the image of Christ, and I still got all kinds of character flaws. What does that say? I got to go through more of this process. I'm not done yet. Billy Graham wasn't done yet at the end of his life. He was still going through the fire of affliction and going in, getting purified, and getting hammer welded together. The next step is folding or, 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 or making that. So go to the next one. Cons- look at that. Oh, go, hold on. Go back one more. Consider a pure, look at what the Bible says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work in you, that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. What are the key words here? Like, yeah, i got to consider, most of us are like, how can I consider joy when I'm going through trials, right? Perseverance. Perseverance, that it may finish it. The testing of our faith, it produces, per- perseverance is one of those long overtime kind of things. Yeah. Like, i got to make it through this. Huh? This is good stuff. I don't know about you, but, but I'm preparing you. I'm equipping you to walk through the seasons of your life. So you won't give up at the, at the first sign or the second sign or the hundredth time that you walk through something. And blame it on God like he's doing something against you. He's, he doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. He knows who our enemy is, but he's created him to finish this process in your life. And then it goes to be strengthened. This is where, this is a folding process that crosses the grain now if you ever look at somebody who's making like especially a katana some of those katanas some of these these swords that the samurais used were fold thousands of times the metal they would take it and they would put it into and i watched a video on it's really cool but you probably say how nerdy is that but they they put that into the into the the metal into the the furnace and they take it and they start cutting a little edge in it they fold it over And then they put it back and they hammer the heck out of it. Hammer welds those two pieces together. And then they take it back out. It flattens a little bit flatter. And then they fold it the other way. Because steel has grain in it. Right? And so as they cross the grains, time and time again, thin layers develop and it strengthens the overall metal. And if metal and our metal are synonymous, the the metal of our character are synonymous, This folding over and over and over again in our lives, it produces strength in our life. It's going to take some serious strength and cross grain in our life if we're going to defeat our enemy. Come on, somebody. 
We can see this, this, pro, this work, this process at work in the disciples. Look at what Jesus told, told um, uh, Simon, who was later to be called Peter. Luke 22, verse 31. It says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as with wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Wait a minute. Didn't Jesus love Peter? So why is it when Satan asked him, can I sift you? Can I sift Peter, your, your disciple, the one that you're calling to go into all the world and preach the gospel, the one who's going to, after you die and resurrect and go back, the one who's going to take on the mess? He knew he was going to allow him to test him. And he says, after you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. What is this process? Man, we go through this. It looks like valleys and, and mountains and valleys and mountains. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Right? I mean, we're just going through these high times and low times in Christ. Sometimes they cause us like our faith fails. Like, God, where are you in this? You see, God... Jesus knew that Satan was going to sift him, and he didn't hold back. He's like, I'm going to let him. He told him how it was going to go down. And when you've, when you've come out of this trial, when you, when you turn back, strengthen your brother, you're going to be stronger. You're going to have the strength to do what I've called you to do. You're going to do the same process and strengthen your, your friends and your brothers. How, does he, how is he going to strengthen his brothers? He was going to speak into their lives the victories that God just brought them through. Hey, I just went through a major battle, but God had my back and he brought me out of it. That's the folding process. That's the folding process. Sometimes you get down on yourselves because you're saying, like, I didn't do so good in that trial. Like, man, I, I yelled at my husband or I yelled at my wife. I, I spanked my kid too hard out of wrath. And man, I feel shame and I, 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 I didn't do so well. But when you've tur- God helps you and you get through it and you pray and they pray for you and, and you make it through it as a family, you're stronger. And you're able to do something with that. Those changes start happening in your life. It starts to become one with the metal. Those changes happen in your, in your character over time. And now you're able to, to handle that. The next time you get faced with that same cir- circumstance, I'm not handling it like that again. Hey, let's pray together. My wife can, can testify. I went through all kinds of seasons, all kinds of seasons where she had to deal with me. But you're really being mean to your family. And I would change how I was being mean from one area to another, but God started working out all those areas till I was a better dad and better husband, right? I'm an A-type personality, driver, driver, get it done, and, and sometimes at the expense of my family, but he's taught me over time, and now that I've won those victories, I can help you win those victories. When you're going through it, man, I'm blowing it, I'm not doing so well, I can show you how to do, and he wants to work the same process in you. It's the folding we need this in our life. It just, it's going to happen time and time again, sometimes thousands of times until we finally get it. Me and my knuckleheadedness, it like takes sometimes, like I got to get that pounded out of me. Huh? But don't get too hard on yourself because it's a part of the strengthening process. And then we need to be shaped. And that's just more hammering. Hammer, 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 hammer. Fold, hammer, hammer, hammer. More heat, hammer, hammer, hammer. Hammer time. <laughs> huh? Do, 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 do. No, <laughs> I shouldn't do that. I'm too fat. <laughs> Listen, what good is a weapon if it's not shaped like a weapon? I mean, this, when this passage talks about uh, shaping a weapon fit for its way, it's not just talking about swords. I mean, there's axes, there's hammers, there's, there's all like arrowheads, there's all kinds of things, whatever's needed at that time, but it needs to be shaped and shaped like something that's going to be effective. If you just have a lump of steel, you know, like, yeah, you could club somebody to death, but, you know, club the devil to death, but he wants us to be effective and shaped. I believe God uses our trials we go through to shape our, our, our character, to shape us. Second Peter 1 talks about that. Like, add into your faith goodness, into your goodness, knowledge, your knowledge, self-control, and, and perseverance. And if, you're, if you do these things in increasing measure, it'll keep you from being un- unproductive and ineffective. That's our shaping process. Our character is getting shaped more and more into the image of Christ. And I want to show you how all this fits together, but I'm going to keep going. The next thing is it has to be hardened. Having a lump of steel that comes out of, it looks like a sword and everything else, but steel has to be hardened. 
It's still brittle, even though it has the metal. Uh, anybody who works with metal will tell you, they, just because you, you, you shape it like a, a, a sword, it doesn't mean it's going to stand the test of time, even after you fold it thousands of times. You've got to burn it. You've got to take that, that fire, stoke it up until it's like glowing white hot, and then that process, you take it out with the tongs, and you, and you drop it in water slowly. Or in these days, we've learned that you can drop it in oil and case harden it. It just slowly, though, it's, it's steam. It, this is a caustic environment. And you're just, it's just slow, slow process. That's why it seems like sometimes God's process in our life, it's taking forever. It's like, why am I not done with this yet? God is hardening this, though. It takes hardened steel to hold an edge. Right? If you can't hold an edge, then you're useless, unproductive. But it's a, it's a, it takes a long time for this process to happen. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. Character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who, he, who has been given to us. Look at these key words right here. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Hope is one of those things that's in the future. It's long-suffering. Hope and love is long-suffering. God pours. It's this this thing where it shows that he's poured his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. It's like the same thing as a a foundry that's going on. This process is long, though, to to harden us, (laughs) to have us grow. We all want a, a quick resolve or a quick victory. I don't know about you if I'm the only one. When I'm going through financial struggles, man, God, I need a I need a victory now. Like, I, I'm going to fold right now. I'm, all cards are in. And I know some of you have had this conversation with God. You, some of you have been like, you know, if you don't come through for, for, for me right now, I'm giving up. Huh? Say something. I, 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 what's the, how's the song go? Say something, I'm giving up on you. That's how we treat God. Say something, God, because otherwise I don't believe you're real. We want the quick solution. But that's not how he works. And the more that we understand that, that I've got to go through this, and I've got to let this work finish its process in me so I can be useful in his hands, fit for war. Yeah. Endurance. Truth is, God shows this process in his scripture over and over and over and over again. All through the Old Testament. All through the New Testament, every person who's ever stepped out to be called his child has gone through this, this person, this, this process. Truth be told, we will keep going through the fire until the character of Jesus is developed in us. He's the one who wins the victory, right? The more Jesus in us, the more victory. That's a simple equation. More Jesus, more victory. More Jesus, more victory. And then after you've been hardened, you need to be sharpened. It's a grinding process that, that takes the, the, a sharpened, uh, it's the, uh, Proverbs twenty seven seventeen says that iron sharpens iron, so one man will sharpen, his, start sharpen another. It takes harder steel or a harder surface. Today we use files, we use, we use grinding wheels and everything else, but in their day, they would take like a millstone and they would go around and it was just a long process of grinding that down into a sharpened edge. Without a sharp edge, you know, you're just going to slip off and probably cut yourself. <laughs> Ever work in the kitchen? You need a sharp edge. If we're going to fight against the enemy, it needs to be sharp. Hello, somebody. But it takes a harder metal to sharpen metal. Being around somebody who's gone through the process is the only way that we can really be sharpened in our life. Listen, our first tendency as Christians is when we're going through things, and I've, I know because I've walked through this, when you're going through trials and tribulations, the first tendency that you have is to isolate and to feel shame like, I can't let anybody know I'm going through this. They'll think I'm weak. They'll think that I've got these issues in my life and then that'll disqualify me from anything that I'm going to do in the church. That's a lie of the devil. We're to take captive every lie that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. I've been through it. You've been through it. We've all been through it together. Huh? 
We need each other. That's the enemy's strategy to, to make you feel unqualified. Like I gotta, but no, you need to get around people who have been through the battle, people who will be able to speak into your life, people who are going to be able to, to, to rub up against you and say, no, come on, man, you, you're, you're too mature for that. Come on, I'm going to help you get through this. I don't look negatively at you. I've been through the same thing. I can guarantee you we'll laugh about it afterwards. We're going to sit there and say, yeah, I remember hey, you, last week I went through that. I thought, you're the pastor. You're supposed to have it all. No, I've just gone through more battles. I've just been doing this for 30 years and been hit a couple times upside the head. And I want to help you get through it. I'm not looking down on you. I want to help you reach your potential. But it takes somebody stronger in your life. And you can't isolate. You can't say, like, I don't want to talk to him about it because he's not going to like me anymore. It's just not the truth. We need this in our life. That's what it means. Iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another. Sometimes we want to hang around with people who are weaker than us. Like, oh, they're, they're the same as me, so I'm just going to, I'm going to buddy up with them. You're not doing yourself any good. You might be battle-hardened, but you're not getting sharpened through the process. And if you're an unsharp weapon, you're not going to be able to inflict the type of damage against the enemy that needs to be done. The very last thing is that this, this weapon needs to be tested. I don't want to go to war with an untested piece of weaponry, Right? I want to make sure that this thing works. 1 Peter 6, 1, verse 6 and 7 says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have may, may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Is 1 Peter 1, verse 6 to 7 in there? Look at that. No weapon is ever sent into battle without testing. We need to have our faith tested. We need to be able to stand the test of time. So when, when, Jesus, when we talk about the Isaiah 54 passage right here in verse 16, where it says that, the black, that God created the blacksmith, the destroyer, to wreak havoc, to make a weapon fit for its war, you can bet your bottom dollar that as we're looking at the process of how bl blacksmith works, He's testing whatever he does. You are going to be tested. The strength of, of your character is going to be tested time and time again until you're able to handle a blow. If you go on to the next verse right here, 54 verse 17, I want to carry on to what this is saying. So after you've been forged into a process, into a weapon fit for work, and I'm almost done, no weapon formed against you will prevail. So wait a minute, I thought you were being forged into a weapon. Yeah, but the enemy is out here forging weapons against your family and against your faith and against your character and against your community and against your brothers and sisters in Christ and the ones that are on the outside. He says that after this process, after we've been tested, after, we've been, after he's made a weapon fit for war, no weapon formed against you will prosper. This is the end game right here. And that you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is their vindication for me, declares the Lord. Now this says a lot right here. I love this passage because it, it really tells us that there are four results of, of this process of go, us going through the fire and the trials and the, and, and the tribulations over and over again. We're being made into a weapon that can stand in the, in the face of the enemy. And four, re, four results happen. No, no weapon formed against us will prevail. We'll be able to take a blow. The enemy's weapons is, is going to shatter against us, is what it's saying, that his weapon isn't going to be as, as useful as the one we've been made into because we've been hardened right, because we've gone through the process right. The second thing is that you will refute every tongue that accuses you. Listen, we can stand when accused is a major victory. How many of you know that, that all of your family, all of your friends, everybody you used to run around with, they're all pointing the finger, oh, he's just on a high pedestal. He just, he just thinks he's something, but he's nothing. Watch, you wait, he'll fall. They're all saying it right now. When you put your faith in Christ, they're looking at you like you're, you've just put your faith in a crutch. Like you're giving yourself an excuse for the things that you used to do. And they're going to talk about you. They're going, to, they're going to say slanderous things. Why? Our battle isn't against flesh and blood. We've got an enemy that's sitting there coaching them. Attack his character. Attack his accountability. Attack his integrity. Attack his motives. Why, his ambition. Why is he doing what he's doing? 
That's what it's saying right here, is that we will, we will refute every tongue that rises in accusation. Are the accuser of the brethren, the devil is hard at work trying to tear you down. No weapon formed against you is going to prosper, but this is important. We can stand when accused. Our metal is tested. Who I am, my character is tested. Our character will be called into question. People will see the things you go through, just like Job. And then they'll blame your lifestyle or your choices or your God, your purity or your motives. But when we've gone through these things the right way, God will show everybody, just like Job's outcome. That's what he's saying right here, is that we will refute every tongue that rises in accusation. We'll be able to stand and say, you know what? I did it through God's help. You can be pointing at him the whole time. He brought me through this 300 times to get me to where I'm at. This is important for you. Listen, there's going to be people in your families talking about you. Stand. There's going to be people at your workplace talking about you. Stand. Go through it the right way. Don't end up at have to, having to, to go through that because you didn't pass the test that time and have to go back into the fire again to have God work this out. You can stand now through the power of Jesus, through calling out to Jesus. You can fall on Jesus and allow him to help you, and you will stand there. And when, when they're throwing sticks and stones, it's going to just fall right off. Huh? Sticks and stones may break my bones. Right? But what does it say about words? They can hurt you. It can destroy you. It's not the truth. With Jesus, you'll be able to stand against every... That, I, I want that in my life. I want to do things God's way, the right way, and when people throw accusations at me, where's the proof, bro? Dig. Go, ahead, go on. Uncover. Try to uncover. Try to say something. But that's the heritage. That's the fourth, third thing is that it's a heritage. This is, this is how we know. This is the heritage uh, of the servants of the Lord. The, the, what is a heritage? It's a, an inheritance. It's an inheritance. That's what, remember what, what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 4? It says, I brought you out of the iron smelting furnace of Egypt to be my own people, an inheritance. This is our heritage from the Lord. Our inheritance is to be a people who stand, who when the enemy tries to strike, we just stand. When the enemy tries to throw verbal accusations against us, we just stand. You're going through the fire right now? Let's all stand in this place. If you're going through the fire right now, this is the vindication. Listen, this is where the gospel is in this, this message. We could have the worship team come up. This is their vindication for me. Our God wants to vindicate you of the things that you've walked through. He wants to, he, every tongue that has rised against you in accusation, God wants to vindicate you. But listen, this is an interesting word in the Hebrew. This word in the Hebrew doesn't mean vindication the way that we know and understand vindication. We understand vindication mean like I'm going to prove that you are right and they were wrong. That's vindication, right? That I'm going to show everybody that you are the right guy. God is going to do that. But this word for vindication in the Hebrew is righteousness. It's the same word that says, my righteous one will live by faith. This is a truth bomb that Isaiah planted. And he was saying, this is the heritage that you have for me, that I am going to make you righteous. It's not going to be you doing it. I'm going to work this stuff out of you and make you into a weapon, and you won't be able to take any credit from it. That's what God is saying right here. I am going to impute my righteousness to you. I'm going to give you my victory. I'm going to give you my son who's going to stand in your place. He's going to fight your fights for you. Our God is going to be the one who tears down every weapon that formed against you. Our God living inside of you as you open your life to him is going to give you his righteousness. Righteousness means you are right with God, just as if you never sinned, justified in him. This is a truth bomb from all, all, for all ages right here. This is your heritage as servants of the Lord. Your righteousness is from him. And yes, he vindicates you in that. He'll make the devil bow down at your feet is what it says in Revelations. And say, oh, Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him. Listen, here in this place, you may have been going through the fire lately. This message is meant to encourage you that you can stand in Jesus. That God has given you his righteousness no matter how you've acted through it. No matter what you've done wrong, Jesus paid the price on the cross already. He's given you the victory Right from day one, we're not fighting for the victory. We're fighting from a place of victory. And surely our character is being reformed and, and tested and tried because we want to be good representatives of the name that he's given us. 
This is your inheritance. He's given you a name. Above every name, that every, at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue confess. He's given you a name to represent. And so he wants you to be able to fight the good fight, but just know that it's not about right, being right with God. You're already made right with God. He's given you that. That's the place of victory that we can, it doesn't matter. Devil, you can't throw anything at me anymore. Devil, what can you possibly do? My God has already beat you. He's defeated death. He's defeated the grave. My God has already given me the victory. And sure, I got flaws, but God is going to vindicate me. God is going to bring me through this. And he's going to help me to shine. But right now, you've got to settle something in your heart. How am I going to go through this test? How am I going to go through this trial? How am I going to go through this tr persecution that's happening around me? Am I going to say, God, where are you at? And shake my fist at you and say, I'm done? Or am I going to say, God, help me? Because it's too much for me. That's what he's really wanting from you right now. I want to pray for you here today. If you've been going through the fire, 